Hi, everybody, and welcome to this edition of The Taking Control of Your Diabetes Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Dr. Jeremy Pettis, and I am joined, as always, by my good friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Edelman. So if you are just tuning in, Steve and I are both endocrinologists. We work at the University of California, San Diego. We both have type 1 diabetes since we were the age of 15. And of course, we work for the not-for-profit Taking Control of Your Diabetes that Steve founded, I don't know, 25 years ago or so. 1995, you were in utero. Yes, I was. Thank you. <laughs> um, so this uh, podcast is um, you know, kind of kicking off the new year. And there's a lot to talk about with diabetes and the new year and maybe resolutions, all this kind of stuff. And we thought, who better to join us than our good friend, Carrie Sparling, who we've known for a long time. And before I kind of have her introduce herself and say hello, Steve, um, anything you want to say about Carrie? And- well, I would just say, we, you know, Carrie became involved in presenting at Taking Control Your Diabetes and uh, at many, many conferences, super impactful and funny as hell mm-hmm. and has lots of stories and has lived right through diabetes and pregnancy, and um, so glad we can start the new year with Carrie. Yeah, so Carrie has type 1 herself, and you know I've known her, it seems like, forever. And um, if you have diabetes, definitely look out for her, because she's just so good at kind of relaying information in a lovable, kind of relatable way, and just a good time. So we, So Carrie, say hi. Well, you guys are so much more patient with me than my own family. Thank you for that. <laughs> And Carrie's joining us by Zoom, so we can actually see her, um, and you know you can kind of see us when we stick our hands out there, Carrie. But so, Carrie, just tell us, like you know, tell us your story. Say say hi to our listeners, and you know, and go. Sure. So my name is Carrie Sparling, and I've had type one diabetes since September of 1986, which is 37 years, which is a long time. And as we've talked about multiple times, I keep hoping it's not going to be, you know, a thing that's around forever, but it like appears that it's going to be. So I'm uh, really nesting, I think, with it at this point. (laughs) Um, And I live in Rhode Island. I've been writing online about diabetes since 2005. And I, Steve had mentioned before, I've had the pleasure of joining you guys at several conferences over the years. So it's been a a good ride, despite the weirdness of the whole disease. Including our our big face-to-face conference when we used to do those in Rhode Island. And I do remember the Dunkin' Donuts uh, sign, the company next to the convention center in Rhode Island. Is it still there? I don't know. Um, I feel like that convention center changes hands and names every 15 minutes. So come come back through, see what it's called. It's like our, yeah, well, it's my bait. If, if you can give us an update on the situation with the Dunkin' Donuts via <laughs> well, the conference well, room in Rhode Island, that would be great. We, we are fixated on donuts anyway. <laughs> um, so Carrie, I'm kind of interested because, you know, I kind of felt like, I got involved in, with TCOID and you were already there. So I'm kind of curious about how you met Steve and how you got involved with TCOID or if you remember how that happened. This is the weird part, right? So we've been doing this for such a long time that I don't remember the actual origin story, but I do remember one of the first times that I met Steve was doing a one touch commercial for the Vario IQ. And he had the nicest blue, actually, I think I'm wearing this blue sweater today in homage to Steve's blue sweater that the, he wore at that shoot. But it was like kind of the first time that he and I had interacted and I thought he was so fancy. Um, and it was nice to find out that he was fancy, but he was also a normal human being. Why are you laughing? He seemed really reasonably I've, fancy. I've many but, words <laughs> to describe Steve. Fancy has never been one of yeah, them. Yeah, I had this. You should have seen nice the look sweater. on my face. <laughs> fancy. I love fancy. So, but then, you know, your initial involvement was kind of online. And is that, tell us about how, you know, maybe that got started, your initial getting into that space and becoming kind of known in the diabetes world. How did that happen? Yeah, you, you really got that I, space moving, Carrie. Well, the space was already moving before I got into it just a little bit. There were So I started back when people were actually blogging and doing long form online content instead of like the snippet micro blogging or just visual stuff that people are doing now. But it was in 2005. And when I logged on, there was Amy Tenderish's Diabetes Mine and Scott mm-hmm. Johnson's Scott's Diabetes Log. Then there were two other bloggers. So there were like three or four people who were already writing. And I found that so exciting because I'd never seen anybody in my real life talking about diabetes to find those people who were chronicling the day-to-day online in a way that I could sort of digest and contribute to in my own way. It was, I thought that was so cool because like I said, my my real life didn't include other people who had diabetes. So being able to find them online was exciting. And so I started to share my story. And honestly, I think it was over the course of just a couple of months, that small blogging community kind of bloomed into something much, much bigger. And it kept compounding and compounding. And all of a sudden there were dozens and then hundreds of people who were writing diabetes blogs, which is just wild when you think about it. 
all these people sharing their stories and we could find one another and have those moments of, yeah, me too. And that felt really, really good. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, I feel like you really kind of launched this whole area mm-hmm. too. Um, and so nice. maybe like those first stories, like how did that go? I mean, did you kind of think, gosh, I just want to share my story and these these first kind of posts you had, was it just always kind of about you and your life or, or how did you approach that? Carrie, remind well, us like, of, the, oh, yeah, of the name, Until Me. It was me. called Six Until Me, that's which it. was dumb, that's but it. I'll come back to that in a minute because <laughs> okay. I wasn't even six when I was diagnosed. There's a whole urban legend around that whole thing. Um, but I, I feel like back in 2005, when you would put diabetes into Google and look for information, you would find all these reasons why you're going to die. That is awful <laughs> to get fed back to you by a search engine. And so I feel like these early bloggers and these people who were earlier in the diabetes online community were trying to show that you could live with this disease, that you could find life after diagnosis sort of stuff. And then they were talking and we were talking about the day-to-day parts of diabetes. So it wasn't like, what's your A1C and how much do you take for a pizza? It was, how do you disclose diabetes in a job interview? How do you talk about it with your kids? How do you rationalize certain things in your own head when you're talking to the insurance companies? Like the stuff that we're actually doing to live with this. And I feel like people sharing those stories, that real life sort of common bond that we were able to find with one another Mm -hmm. and helps Mm -hmm. people's health outcomes. When you know you're not alone and you feel like you have a community of people that can support you when it's good and when it's bad, you feel better about doing the to-do list of diabetes. I feel like that can't be understated. That's what you guys are doing through the conferences, whether they're virtual or in person, you're bringing people together so they can find their people. You know, Carrie, one thing I remember that you really were a leader in was talking about complications. And, you know, you spoke at the big one conference, I think our very first one out in San Diego. And mm-hmm. that really made a big impact on me personally and all the people that went to that workshop. And there there were so many tears during that workshop. And I, I, I wanted to thank you for coming out of the closet and sharing your story at that time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and oh, I would I add to that, 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 you know, it wasn't like to your point, Carrie, it wasn't complications in terms of the stats of, you know, if everyone sees this, this is when it's going to happen. It's, it was very personal kind of what you've been through. Like it's always the dark cloud over all of our heads, you know, kind of trying to avoid these things. And if you do have them, the, you know, some of the shame that goes along with it and how to deal with that, which is just absurd, but we all kind of carry it around. And yeah, I went to those, um, sessions too. And they were, they were great. And they actually did really help Steve open up. I had the hardest time for years to get Steve to talk about complications or, you know, what he deals with at all. Um, and so thank you for that. And now he, uh, yeah. he won't stop talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you really made me think about it and I didn't, I didn't really do much with that other than think about it. And then Jeremy really gets credit for just knocking the shit out of me and saying, Steve, come on, share your story. And you know what? And now I look back and I, I'm really happy I did. And I talk about it like, uh, getting an ice cube stuck in your well, throat. It's just, uh, you know, one of those things. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually just happened, but we're hopefully going to edit that out. Cause Steve was coughing for about 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, no, I think, um, yeah, and we talked about guilt with complications, but then you mentioned too, that you felt kind of another level of guilt, you, Steve, being an endocrinologist, like, are people going to take you mm-hmm. seriously of like, hey, um, you should do this with your blood sugars, but, you know, well, why do you have complications? Yeah. So, you know, I get it. But anyways, if you've ever well, that's been the to... Thing. That's the that's, oh, I was going to say, that's kind of the dark bit about the complication part, because it seems like if in your, if you're in any kind of space like you guys being clinicians, or if you're in an advocate sort of role, you're supposed to be perfect all the time. And I think that's bullshit. And I feel like that that's one of the realities of living with diabetes, that things happen, right? And so if different things happen, you have to have the same support for when things were quote unquote perfect as you would if anything else rolls your way. Again, that community aspect of things, when you know people are dealing with what you're dealing with, it's easier to lighten the burden of it. Mm-hmm. Well, we just I also would actually, never want to be credited with kicking the shit out of Steve. That's awful. So I'm glad that was a you thing. Now <laughs> you're loosening up. I mean, he's, uh, so, he's so fancy too. So I don't want to yeah, so hurt him. That's my that fancy, fancy words. But we just um, we just did a virtual conference a couple of weeks ago, and one of the um, talks I guess we did we called it like a day in, in life with with diabetes, and the idea was that Steve and I were going to film things that happened in our life that you know required some kind of diabetes thought or whatever. And we were initially thinking, well, this is going to take a week or two for us to get enough, you know, filming to, to put this together. 
it took us one day, you know, and we each filmed these little snippets of, you know, this is me in the morning. This is, you know, what I'm eating. We went high, we went low. And to your point, Carrie, people really, I think, enjoyed that because it was like, here's, you know, endocrinologists or you or people that are supposed to know everything going high and going low. And there's some, um, <laughs> like, commodity there about that we're all struggling with this, that this is tough. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carrie, yeah. you know, you started six until me. You're going to tell us a mm-hmm. little bit about that. Then there was, Carrie took a sabbatical kind of thing. And then now you're back and would love to hear what you're doing now and let our listeners uh, know and so they can partake. So I did, I did stop blogging. So I wrote six until me.com from 2005 until 2019 when I turned 40. And it was kind of an arbitrary thing because when I was diagnosed at the age of seven, I was like, Oh, 40 is going to suck. I'm probably going to feel old and super unwell. And then 40 came and went and I was like, Oh, I'm still here. Okay. (laughs) And so I thought that, you know, I wanted to go and celebrate being older and healthy. And then this like pandemic thing came and swooped in and grabbed us all by the ankles. And that part sucked. And I realized that in the isolation of COVID and dealing with a lot of that, I really missed the diabetes community. I thought that I would have sort of loose access. And when we went into the hole, it was like, oh, no, we're really all on our own. And so that made me want to reconnect with the diabetes online community. So instead of blogging, though, I went the route of a Substack, which is a newsletter sort of. It's like a blog that you email out and you can have it behind a subscription paywall, which I I like both the intimacy and the privacy of that. So that's that is what the older version of me feels more comfortable with. And I've been working um, since 2000, uh, since August, 2023 um, on that. So it's newer, but it's, I like it. It's very nice. It feels good. And the URL, cause I'm shameless is uh life with type one diabetes.com. And oh. so when people sign up, then they get access to kind of, would you call it kind of a, a blog or sure. how would you describe it? Yeah, you it? can call it. So I, I hate email generally speaking. And so the Substack thing, it sends out a bunch of emails. I would prefer not to do that. So I send out an email digest, but if there are posts on the Substack that are behind the subscription wall, then you have to be subscribed and signed in in order to read them. Got it. So yeah, yeah. I want to ask you that, you know, I think probably the main reason that people love you is they relate to, you know, what you, what you talk about. You put a lot of yourself into what you write and, and how, How does that go? I mean, do you ever feel like sometimes you're giving too much or I was kind of interested to hear that you, you felt like you missed the diabetes community. So how do you kind of balance that? Like, you know, what's personal, your personal life with what you share? Um, Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, sure thing. I think somebody years and years ago told me that once you publish it, it's forever public. And I always kept that as like the mantra by which I decide to write about certain things. So writing about a disease, um, like diabetes that I've had for a really long time and I'm really comfortable with talking about felt organic and easy. I don't write about my kids online. I feel like that is their, it's their story to share. So I don't talk about like potty training, any of that garbage. That's just overexposing my own kids. But I will talk about diabetes and how it impacts parenting or how, diabetes and how it impacts my marriage or, um, you know, different friendships and that sort of thing, because I feel like that's some of the universal everyman stuff that people with diabetes are living with, but I don't like disclose exactly where I live, even though it's Rhode Island. So it's probably whittled it down a bit just by being the smallest state ever. Um, but you know, things like that, like you want to keep in mind, (laughs) (laughs) I'll report back, but it's just, you have to always keep in mind that the people that reading your stuff, they aren't always going to be people with diabetes who live in Montana could be my mother-in-law who I love dearly, but like, I don't want to say weird shit that she's going to read and want to talk to me about unless I'm comfortable having that discussion with her. So it's always through that sort of tempered lens that I think I've come by, by being an old bat. Well, I mean, if you're not going to talk about potty training, then I'm out. I mean, that's what I was. No, I'll, that's what I, I mean, there for. You, yeah, sorry, that's gross. <laughs> I think people, so. And that's kids get to make those choices, not me. You know, you you you're in contact with a lot of people with diabetes, and I kind of have a note here of, you know, are there themes like when people do come up and talk to you, whether it's in person or on online, like that you just kind of hear over and over and over again um, that maybe you wanted to share with our listeners. Yeah, sure. One one thing that is a back and forth that I have with parents of kids with diabetes and adults who have um, diabetes is that there always seems to be this information share, information sharing of like parents like to read from adults with diabetes, what it's like when we're high, how I feel when I'm low, what it's like to navigate these certain nuances of life with type one, because it helps them understand their child better. But reciprocally, as an adult with type one, I love hearing about how parents are dealing with and viewing and and loving their children because it gives me a sense of what my mother had to deal with when I was growing up and helps build that that sort of empathy model with people who took care of me when I was young. So I I like the back and forth that happens in the community because it's not just this one-sided, 
megaphone. It is an actual conversation that happens with people who are touching in at all different points of diabetes. And that's pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love your new format too, because it, it sounds a little old schoolish where it's not just <laughs> rapid fire social media back and forth and you get a little bit of privacy, like you said. And mm-hmm. I, I like the word when you said long form where you can actually write something and not limited to like Twitter's, you know, 52 letters or whatever the, the limit is. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie, you, you- But it helps people get to know one another. And I loved that about older writing styles back in the early aughts in the diabetes community. You got to really know who you were reading. Well, like I said, like, you know, people people love it. And if I remember being at the TCOED conferences and, you know, see all these people kind of like waving at me and getting all excited. And then I realized like Carrie's standing behind me and they would <laughs> run right past me to give Carrie a hug and, you know, just say thank you for what you've written and how it resonates and makes them feel good. So you really do have a skill there with, you know, writing and. Because you're being way too nice to me. When are you going to ask me something mean? <laughs> you gave the keynote address at the end of the conference to kind of close the day many times. And I always had to say to you, Carrie, please talk a little slower. And <laughs> oh I can God. tell you've, you now you're at a, you're at a cadence and a speed that I can actually understand you. So age has slowed down your <laughs> your speech. Uh, Steve, and, the worst thing that ever happened to me was when that lady came up to me. We were taking questions at the end of one of the TCOID ending keynotes, and she came to the front of the stage, and she said, I don't have a question. You just need to slow down a little bit. I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was mortified. <laughs> well, Carrie, how, how are you doing great. with um, – is it fair to talk – how are you doing with your eyes – I know that was the complication you spoke about earlier. You know what's so weird about the complication? Like you feel guilty about having complications. I can say I feel weirdly guilty for having had that one resolve itself. And so Mm -hmm. when we were talking about that, it was when I was managing um, pregnancy. So my daughter is almost 14 and my son is seven. And when my, I was pregnant with my daughter, had some eye complications. And then when I was pregnant with my son, they kind of returned, but they have resolved themselves since my son was born. So I feel like, odd survivor's guilt about not dealing with that particular thing. But as I age, there's other things that happen. The, you know, if I take a statin now, I hope I'm very proud of myself for taking the statin because I can't even pronounce the statin. But like, I'm trying to do the proactive <laughs> things that will keep me on the planet and healthy longer. And I know they're in pursuit of avoiding certain complications and issues. And that's its own tangled web of things to talk about, like to make sure that you can have the discussions that are uh, help inform decisions that will keep you in the in the clear, so to speak, as well as how to deal with it if something puts you in the dirt not the actual dirt but like in the downer sort of yeah, things. we got you not dead dirt yeah important so, clarification Yeah, you know, we're calling this kicking off the new year with carrie so we didn't kind of <laughs> prep you specifically with this but you know it is going to be the new year here so anything resolutions you're making do you like when it do you make resolutions or let's keep it kind of i guess in the diabetes frame i mean i feel like every year I come to some idea about what I'm going to do with my carbs or weight or alcohol. And it usually goes out the window in a couple of weeks, but <laughs> what, weeks. how about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, not that long, Jeremy. <laughs> I know a January has never felt like a resolution sort of thing. If anything, I feel it in September when my kids go to school, I feel like, all right, that's the time when I'm going to start being the best person ever. But honestly, I feel like there's a reset every time I change an infusion set or a CGM, mm-hmm. because like if I have a 10 day span where my blood sugars are a garbage can, I put a new sensor on and I'm like, oh, this is my chance to get it right for 10 days. Like that becomes the resolution moment, which is, which is pretty good. No, I feel like there's so much to do, right? With diabetes, the to do, to do list is intense and it's long and it's every single day. So I feel like if people are making resolutions to make them smaller and manageable, something that you actually can stick with, like I am going to wear my CGM. I am going to put my prescriptions on auto refill. So I actually get them on time. I am going to do you know, X, Y, and Z, whatever it is, but to make it something that you can follow through on so that you can have that pride point of, yeah, I did it. Even if it was just that one little thing. Absolutely. I think, you know, what I'm pushing Steve to do, we're talking about little resolutions. I don't know if this is a little one or a big one for you, but Steve has, I think, agreed to not buy any more Lululemon products in 2024, <laughs> which is a big deal because I don't know if you, how well people know Steve Elliman, but he is typically head to toe Lululemon. Like today. Like today. <laughs> and so 2024 is apparently going to be Steve's first non lulu year. Do you want to comment on that, Steve? Well, you know, Carrie, I mean, well, first of all, I like your suggestion. Most people that make huge resolutions, they cannot follow them. And, you know, it sounds to me like you kind of wait until you get some free time after you drop the kids <laughs> off to school. But, you know, I, 
I like clothes that you don't have to <laughs> take to the dry cleaner and that they don't wrinkle. And, you know, they look pretty cool. And so, and the pants fit me because I got weird legs. Oh, my God. This so, is not going to happen. So, Everybody, anyway, like, I, <laughs> I am going to stick to it because okay. I told Jeremy, I pretty much have everything in the store that there's no, <laughs> whenever I go into Lululemon, I can't find anything I don't have. But, you know, Do they know you by name? No, no, they don't. They really should. Have they, they named like pants after you yet or something? Like the Steve, is there, does that exist? <laughs> what do you want to tell them about the pants that. that you like? Yeah, they have the ABCs. I mean, you've heard of those, Carrie. I've been to, has your husband ever bought any Lululemon pants? I can neither confirm nor deny what my husband is <laughs> it's, it's the, it's, <laughs> purchasing. It's, it's the biggest selling item of all the clothes, <laughs> men and women. And ABC. What does ABC stand for? Was that a setup? Because you know what it stands no. for? No. No, I don't Anti know what it stands for. <laughs> Anti-ball crushing. And that's that's Lululemons, but I did hear that they got pressured to change the name. Mm. So it's... Wait, but, that's uh, really what it's called? That's yeah. really what it stands yeah, for? Yeah, yeah. So anyways, that's Steve's hopefully New what's, Year's resolution. What's, what's yours, Jeremy? I don't know, but you can give me one. How about that? I gave you some. I wrote them down. Yeah, that was about like... Yeah, it was about not drinking for like a week. And I'm like, no thanks. No, it was like 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> but Carrie, um, you know, you've written two books now. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. I've written three. Oh, three. actually I've written four, weirdly. Well, so I, I wrote I wrote a, a, a book in 2014 with Spry Publishing called Balancing Diabetes, which I've mentioned before. Terrible title because I don't know how to do that. So, um, but it's a it's a good book. And then I wrote a poetry book when we were all in quarantine mm -hmm. and it's that's, all that's diabetes right. poetry and it's called rage bolus. And it's, um, I love it deeply. It is my favorite. Um, I put out a book of essays from my blog six until me. I put that out in May of last year. And then my daughter and I wrote a book about our cat. That's wicked fluffy. And we wrote a short story about how it makes a sweater out of its own fur. And it's called loopy makes a sweater. It's pretty oh, that's awesome. oh, I, I knew about the three, but mm -hmm. I didn't hear about that last one. So we can get, we yeah. can get that on your website. <laughs> I have the other you three. Can. <laughs> so, and Loopy doesn't have diabetes. That, that fourth one is a collector's item. What's Loopy that? doesn't have diabetes, I'm guessing. This is a very. No, and she doesn't even have fur by the end of it because she's wearing this like super fly sweater. So, well, that's unfortunate. She lost all of her no, fur. No, she get, looks hot. It's good. A sweater and then she wears it? You're ruining the book. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, well, other things yeah. we kind of talking about, I suppose, is, you know, we're talking about New Year's resolutions, but I had a note here, too, about, Carrie, maybe your evolution with, with Type 1, how it's changed over time, and maybe, like, where you are at with it now. You mentioned now you're 40, like, I don't know, is there some new perspective or or kind of what fitting it into your life or, or coming to terms with it? I don't know. Any thoughts you, you have there? Are you still going to well, therapy for diabetes? Am I going, like, to insulin therapy or, like, like actual therapy? Yeah, actual therapy. Um, I, I have gone to therapy for diabetes related anxiety in the past, but I, I, I like the idea of therapy. I like that it's very normalized to ask about it and do it. And I, I just think that's really powerful. We, but we what's my relationship with diabetes? I wish I was divorced from it. I wish, <laughs> um, sorry, I just saw the school bus go by. So I can, con we can edit this part out, um, but I will have to at least go to the door so that the bus driver sees that I'm in the house. Okay. So they let okay. my son off. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, I feel like diabetes is something that I feel more at peace with. But what is interesting is that I used to never think about a cure. It was something that I felt really resistant about even embracing in any way. And, and now I'm getting excited about the fact that technology may become the don't think about it cure that I've been waiting for. Hmm. Sorry, looking for that school bus. Yeah, well, but like, you know, that it might not be a biological thing. It might not be something that they insert inside of me and it makes, you know, insulin again. But I feel like there is going to be a device that I can slap on, not think about other than accessing the, the bits and pieces and paying through insurance. And it does diabetes for me and really turns down the burner um, of thought. So that's exciting. Well, yeah, things are getting better and better. You know, they have the eyelet now that mm -hmm. all you have to do is announce your meal, small, medium, large, and that's it. Well, I think I totally agree, Carrie, that, you know, I wrote off a cure a long time ago it actually used to make me angry when people would talk about it because it's like, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, well, look, we got to deal with this and do our best. But I think there is so much going on in the technology world, non-technology, I had cells type, you know, there's just a ton that there is a good chance now that you and I and Steve will die with, you know, 
our own insulin circulating in our in her blood or whatever. But I think the point mm-hmm. for me is that I'm okay. Like with the technology is doing well. Like I think I've come to terms with having diabetes as well as I possibly could. It still means like it drives me nuts. I mean, I was late for this podcast because my multiple sensors were failing and mine was reading 44 and even though I was like 100 and Steve was calling me I mean the stuff still drives me nuts but man it's getting better and I'm really like excited 2024 I think is going to be a, like a really big year for diabetes honestly I think it'll be big it's big it's been big for type 2 but it's don't you think that it's our turn baby it's really exciting for mm-hmm. type 1 as well well as soon as we figure out where the donut <laughs> Dunkin Donuts is in, in Jeremy, relative to the conference center I, I got a picture right. of it okay. first of all you know i just want to say thanks for coming on and starting off our new year you're really um someone that has made a, a difference in diabetes i'm not just saying that hey buddy and carrie brought her son on now they can't, yeah they can't they can't oh. hear. and <laughs> hi <laughs> and um i think you've done thanks for all oh, that cool. you do yeah absolutely. i really appreciate thanks, it thanks carrie it's so good seeing you um, nice to see you guys too and hope to do it again soon in person yeah Try to get you out to our next one conference, which is that would, that would be awesome. <laughs> My son is staring at me. There is no, there is. I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We can you. Just, All right, you go be with him. We'll wrap it up. So thanks everybody for listening. Thanks Carrie. Thanks Carrie. Love talking to you. Thanks we'll for having us, guys. Sorry. Okay. No problem. Appreciate All right, it. See ya. Bye. Bye.